Just before we get started, I wanted to put a very brief plug in for uh, another Pakistan event we're organizing next week. This focuses on Pakistan's food security, food insecurity. Uh, it's going to be happening next Wednesday. There are flyers outside. It's a very salient issue, and uh, given events of the last few weeks, it's only going to get more salient. So uh, I imagine some of you may be interested. Um, Nicholas Schmidl is a fellow at the New America Foundation. He's written for a number of publications, including the New York Times Magazine, Slate, Smithsonian, The New Republic, The Washington Post, the Virginia, Quar Virginia Quarterly Review, and uh, others. He's reported from Iran, uh, South Asia, and Central Asia, and he received the 2008 Kurt Shork Award for Freelance Journalism. And uh, from 2006 to 2008, as many of you know, he lived and reported in Pakistan as a fellow of the Institute of Current World Affairs. And his new book, To Live or to Perish Forever, Two Tumultuous Years in Pakistan, uh, chronicles his time in Pakistan and provides a contemporary history of that nation during one of its most uh, turbulent eras. And I must say that uh, I think his book's quite a read for various reasons. Um, one major reason, in my view, is that uh, it seems that he went everywhere and uh, spoke to everyone, uh, top leaders from uh, all the political parties, uh, leaders of the Red Mosque. He was in Swat, he was in Waziristan, he was in Baluchistan. He was everywhere, and maybe this is what uh, has eventually caught up to him uh, later on. But uh, at, an, at any rate, it's a very good read, and uh, he clearly knows a great deal about Pakistan and will surely have some very useful insights. So he's going to speak, and I uh, believe that after he concludes his presentation, he'll take uh, questions from from you all. Do I need to touch anything? We're ready no. to go. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming out. As uh, Michael said, the weather's horrendous, and I appreciate you coming out. Did I? I'm sort of coming up and over a bunch of cold medicine and a quick jog in the rain, so if I'm a little rattled, just bear with me. Um, Bob, thanks for hosting this. Michael, thanks for the introduction. My grandparents are here from Connecticut. Thanks for coming down. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the book today kind of in, in a course of three themes, um, which I think recurs throughout the book. The book is ordered chronologically, but there are three themes that it returns back to, one of which is ethnic politics and, and the way that ethnic politics are often overlooked in the debate about Pakistan. The second of which is the, the paranoia and schizophrenia of the state itself. And the third of which is the rise of the Taliban. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, I, I arrived in Pakistan in early 2006 kind of as a total accident. I was originally supposed to go to Iran. Marvin's smiling here because Marvin sort of held my hand throughout this entire period. <laughs> I'd originally gotten this two-year fellowship to go to Iran and spend two years wandering around Iran looking at ethnic politics, identity politics, and whatnot. And about a week after I got the fellowship, Ahmadinejad was elected. And six months after me making regular visits to the Iranian intersection, the Iranian intersection said, look, we're never going to give you a visa to go two years and just wander around Iran doing what you want to do. So <clears throat> I reevaluated. What I wanted, I, I took exactly the same proposal, looking at ethnic politics, identity politics, and I said, you know, I think this sort of applies to Pakistan as well. And what if we just transfer, what if we go back and sort of erase Iran and put it in Pakistan? So Marvin helped me uh, negotiate with the Pakistanis, put in a good word for me, and eventually uh, they let me in. And they let me in as a guest of a pro-government, very, very anti-American, arch-conservative think tank called the Institute of Strategic Studies that housed me for these two years. So one of the things, though, that in the course of my scramble to learn as much about Pakistan before I left was that I ran around and tried to talk to as many Pakistan experts in and around D.C., read as many books as possible. And one of the things that I stumbled upon was the notion that where, where the word Pakistan itself came from, and which is where the title of the book also comes from, To Live or to Perish Forever. In 1933, there was a young, Pakistan, young Indian Muslim named Chaudhry Rahmat Ali who wrote a treatise called Now or Never, Are We to Live or Perish Forever? And in this treatise, <clears throat> Chaudhry Rahmat Ali proposed the idea of Pakistan as an amalgamation of the five Muslim-majority Northwest territories of what was then United India, being the P for Punjab, the A for Afghania, or the Northwest Frontier Province, K for Kashmir, S for Sindh, and TAN for Baluchistan. And in this same treatise, he writes 
that, you know, he essentially writes that we, we, are, we as Indian Muslims are faced with this existential choice. Either we create our own state or, we, or we, we become extinct. And this is when he threw out the phrase to live or to perish forever. And so this ethnic tension has always been at, at the root of Pakistan, has always been at the root of questions of, of national identity. And I wanted to study initially actually subnational identities and sort of the way these were all working against the state. And Marvin said to me, no way. When you go to the embassy, you've got to tell them you want to look at national identity and the questions that revolve around that. So that's, that's kind of where I came at this. So the book was published on uh, <clears throat> May 12th, two and a half, two weeks ago. And exactly two years before then, I arrived in Karachi at a time when the lawyer's protest was the lawyer's protest against, uh, in support of the Chief Justice, who, who President Musharraf had suspended a year earlier, a few months earlier, sorry. And Karachi is a, is, a, is a microcosm of Pakistan. It's a city of about 18 million people that's been long affected by ethnic and sectarian tensions. And two years ago today, these tensions boiled over. So on the night of May 12th, I arrived in Karachi after taking, Ricky and I were sitting at a perfectly appropriate dinner party one night in Islamabad. Now, there's no nightlife in Islamabad. So when there's a dinner party, everyone shows up. I mean, this is the city that's called, that was dubbed by one of our friends, Low Self Esteemabad. Because as foreign journalists, there's just not much to do. So we, uh, so I arrived in Karachi in the middle of the night and got off the airplane and immediately checked my phone. And the hotel that was supposed to have sent the taxi to come pick me up had left a message and said, no taxis, can't get a taxi to the airport. You're going to have just find your own taxi, pay for it, and we'll pay you back. So I go hustling out of the airplane, running through the terminal, run up to the taxi stand, you know, throw myself at the taxi stand, and one taxi, please, to the embassy and hotel. And the guy looks at me and he says, are you kidding me? And we look around, and there are no taxis to be seen anywhere, no cars to be seen anywhere. And there are people, families sleeping all over the sidewalks on the gra side of the grassy knoll. And I said, uh, he said, you know, we haven't had a taxi come in or out of here for the past two hours. The MQM, the, the Mahajra dominated, Mahajras being the groups that migrated from India in 1947. They, this, this ethnic party had blockaded the airport to not allow the Chief Justice to arrive. And Musharraf at this point had one political ally with serious street muscle, and this being the MQM. So Musharraf had said, okay, I need you to do me a favor. When the Chief Justice rolls in on the morning of the 13th, I need you to, to block this place down. So I wasn't there to see the Chief Justice. I was there to see the way these ethnic tensions were going to sort of manifest. And so I was trying to figure out how I got, how I would get into the city. And it's about 2 AM at this point. And I started walking out of the airport. I thought, well, if I walk out of the airport for a while, maybe I'll be able to find a taxi somewhere in Karachi. You start walking. You can hear gunshots going off. And people are grabbing me. And they said, look, you know, I don't know who you are. But you're a very, very fair-skinned blonde guy. And don't go out there. The, the MQM are burning cars. They're burning tires. There's gunshots going off. So I put my head down and kept walking. And at this point, usually I like to travel and work alone. I just found that the sort of the gang mentality of five foreign journalists all writing the same story usually ended up sounding like the same story. <clears throat> so but at this point, I'd never really wanted a traveling companion more. And there's a guy about 10 feet ahead of me, and I call up to him, and I said, you know, excuse me, sir, <laughs> where are you going? He was also walking. Come to find out, this guy was the head of the Karachi Anti-Violent Crime Cell Unit. And he had been on vacation in Islamabad at the time, had been on the same airplane with me, and had been called back as well. So he said, you come with me. I've got a Jeep around the corner. It's, we've got a gunman, a driver, and a little siren that we'll put on top of the car, and we'll eventually get you back to your hotel. <clears throat> so. The drive that should have took 15 minutes ended up taking about two and a half hours as we wound around the city because all the roads were blockaded and whatnot. So I'm going to read, throughout the course, I'm just going to read very, very small segments. So this is from the morning of May 12th as I had slept for about three hours, woke up, and this has got me stepping up onto the roof of the hotel to see what's going on. <clears throat> I walked onto the roof of the Embassy Inn to have a look down over the city. Sharia Fasl, the main road connecting the downtown area to the airport, was empty. Hawks circled above, buoyed by thermals radiating off the asphalt. Gas stations had switched off the pumps and closed so that riders couldn't burn them down. Convenience stores, office buildings, and even the lobby of the Embassy Inn had draped thick carpets over the windows to prevent bricks from crashing through. But the absence of traffic made you wonder if all the preparations had been for naught. How could there be riots with no people? I heard the horns first. 
Down the road, a caravan consisting of more than 40 trucks, buses, and motorcycles inched around a bend, heading in my direction. Men crowded on the tops of the buses, waving the plain red flags of the Awami National Party. The Awami National Party, the Pashtun, national, the Pashtun dominated party in Karachi, the caravan resembled a flotilla of warships heading to battle. Buried somewhere in the mass of vehicles and red flags, an amplified voice barked commands. The distortion of the speaker made it, hard, made it tough for me to understand what he was saying, but I gathered from watching the activists that it had something to do with violent disobedience. Men put down their red flags, leapt off the bus, and began throwing rocks at parked cars and homes. Others snapped branches off the trees that decorated the median and swung them at low-hanging telephone wires. I heard the deep-throated chuck, chuck, chuck of shotguns being fired into the air. The roof struck me as a bad place to be standing during aerial firing, so I headed inside. <clears throat> By the end of that day, more than 40 people had been killed, most of them, remember, most of them Pashtuns and those from the uh, MQM, the, the Mahajra party in Karachi. And in my mind, this signaled the beginning of the end for Musharraf. It showed that he was willing to play, to use these ethnic divisions to try and hold on to his power, and it was just a sign of, of a dictator on the wane. In another, this dynamic is now playing itself out once again today, where in Karachi we see the MQM is the only group with serious street muscle that's able to push back against the Taliban in the cities. And so where the Pashtuns and the Taliban have taken over sections of Karachi, the MQM are the only ones who were in there. The MQM had plastered the sides of the walls when I was there last August, had plastered the sides of the walls with posters that said, save your city from Talibanization. And this was their way of sort of ginning up support for what was going to be a militant response to the Taliban. So I think this is a pretty good pivot to talk a little bit about the schizophrenia and paranoia of, of the Pakistani state itself. And what is the Pakistani state thinking? You know, during, the, during May 12th, this, this violence in Karachi, and during the lawyers' movement that preceded it, while the government and while the army was employing well, while the government was employing the army to go bash on lawyers and civil society in the streets around the country, uh, the Red Mosque in Islamabad, a half a mile from the center of the, of the ISI headquarters, was, was amassing weapons right under the government's nose. And this was, in some ways, this was Musharraf's way of going to the, he could always go to the U.S. and he could always say, look, you know, we've got this Taliban problem, and be able to always point to the Red Mosque. Now, my relationship with this particular mosque, um, I think, is, is a thread throughout the whole story because there was the head of the mosque, Abdul Rashid Ghazi, was for unex, one unexplainable reason very open to me. And I had met him probably five, six, seven times, at least two and a half, three hours each time, and he would sit with me and he was extremely candid. A lot of these religious politicians, particularly when they were talking to Western reporters, were, were, were not willing to show their cards, and Ghazi wasn't like that whatsoever. <clears throat> um, you know, Ghazi, at one point, uh, in, in early 2007, there was a female madrasa that was located adjacent to the Red Mosque. And Ghazi's, what, female madrasa students are called Talabat, rather than Taliban. And so the female madrasa students took over this children's library. And at this point, you started to see, every time I visited, more weapons, more sophistication. You could see that they were, once again, gearing up for something. And so I want to read another passage um, that from inside the mosque and that during this point. <clears throat> I once pointed to a Kalashnikov leaning up against Ghazi's computer desk. That's new, I said. No, I've always had that. But what about that, I asked, pointing to the short, fat cylinder fixed to the underside of the barrel. Oh, that. That's a grenade launcher. A friend recently gave it to me, he said. He showed me how it worked, able to lob grenades over a wall at a range of 1,300 feet. In other words, the perfect weapon to use against an encroaching force if you're holed up, surrounded by high walls inside a mosque. Ghazi had overhauled the, his information and propaganda center after the, his, the, quote, female commandos took over the children's library. A half dozen new computers were brought in, manned by several of Ghazi's tech-savvy disciples. Industrial-grade CD and DVD burners churned out propaganda material and footage of Taliban-led ambushes and IED explosions in Afghanistan. In response to those who suggested that Ghazi wanted to take Islamabad back to the 8th century, he told me, No, we don't want to go backwards. Why would I give up my computer, my mobile phone, my walkie-talkie, and my fax machine? The changes weren't limited to Ghazi's armory and technology either. Just about the only thing that seemingly didn't change in the bowels of Ghazi's operations center were the, quote, spring inks color process chart by Sherwin-Williams tacked up on the wall. 
A weird choice for wall art? Sure. But if you were a jihadi who believed depictions of the human form were haram, then what better way to spruce up a room with color than a poster of paint swatches? Security tightened around the mosque. Getting in to see Ghazi became arduous. He requested that I call at least an hour before arriving. That gave him enough time to notify the vigilante scouts pacing the sidewalks out front that a Western journalist was expected and not to attack him with a rusty shovel. <clears throat> so, besides this double-mindedness and this double policy of playing the Taliban when they needed him and fighting the Taliban when they didn't, I got to see Ghazi's, or I got to see the government's paranoia and schizophrenia very up close. Um, you know, the Pakistani establishment has never been comfortable. They, they always believe that Western journalists will never be able to understand Pakistan. And this think tank where I was, uh, where that had that had hosted my visa and that had sponsored me for the two years that I was there. On, on day one, the woman said to me, "You Western journalists will never understand. You don't speak Urdu, you don't wear local clothes, you don't travel the country, you don't talk to anyone besides bureaucrats." A year later. I was standing in the hallway one day wearing a shawar kameez, speaking Urdu to the guys who were serving the tea in the halls of the office, and she said, there's no way you can be a journalist. You must be working for somebody else. And this, this sort of double-edged sword is constantly undermining um, you know, the ability of, of journalists to work, I mean, the ability of journalists to get into these areas. So, and this, this all sort of boiled over, obviously, in January of 2008, after I had written a story for the Times Mag New York Times Magazine, in which I had traveled in Quetta, in Swat, and a number of other places. And uh, we were deported. The, we, I, the story came out on a Sunday, and on Tuesday, five police officers showed up in our driveway, served a deportation order, and told my wife and I that we had an hour to leave. This is my wife here in the yellow, by the way. <clears throat> and she was uh, the dietitian at the five-star hotel in, in Islamabad. And so I go upstairs and she was also the only non-Muslim American to ever study at the Islamic University. She was six months away from getting her master's degree. So she's upstairs scrambling for an Arabic test the next morning. And I said, it doesn't matter. We're, we're leaving. We're getting kicked out. She said, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I've got this test. I've been studying for months. I've got to ace it. I said, the only way that it's even feasible is if we can find someone who can get the cops off the front door. So she asked me if I had called one of her friends her very, very, very overweight friend from the hotel who was very influential. So he was a, one of Ricky's nutrition clients. So we call him in the driveway. And I said, uh, hey, you know, right now I've got five cops standing in the driveway. What do I do? And he said, well, you're lucky right now because I'm playing bridge with Musharraf's national security advisor. He says, so you pass the phone to the cop and I'll pass the phone to Tariq Aziz. And I looked at this poor police officer and gave him the phone. Five minutes later, they had left and given us 48 hours to leave. We, um, when we left in January, it felt very much like a, like a bureaucratic, a bit of bureaucratic confusion that we'd sort of would go and clear the air and come back. And I went back in August of 2008 to write a story for Smithsonian uh, about Sufism, about the sort of soft side of Islam for Smithsonian, which was, you know, when does Smithsonian ever really tick someone off, right? Um, and my visa took about two and a half months to, get, to be processed. All the relevant intelligence agencies, the head of the ISI, the head of MI, everyone signed off on the visa. So we, we were, it seemingly was, was clear. I met with Asaf Ali Zardari eight days into the trip, the night that Musharraf resigned, and thought, okay, now I've covered all bases. There's no way anything can go wrong. And two mornings later, as we were leaving Karachi, myself and my uh, Cindy translator and the, and the photographer from Smithsonian, started receiving phone calls from the same number from one person pretending to be different people saying that he wanted to meet me in Karachi. And it was sort of a page ripped right out of you know, the, the, the Daniel Pearl textbook here. So we, uh, we blew the guy off. We called the Interior Minister and we said, you know, we just got a call from someone who claims that he works for the Interior Ministry saying that he wants to meet me. And the Interior Minister Secretary said, neither does that person nor does that office exist. We thought, okay, <laughs> all right, now it's getting, now things are getting a little bit more complicated. A half an hour later, we got a call from a friend in Islamabad who said he was watching television, and the TV was reporting that Nicholas Shamble, the editor of Smithsonian Magazine, had been kidnapped in Karachi. And I thought, well, they, they sort of have it right, but they've got it right enough that they're in my head now. So they, they first assigned us an escort 
they, but the escort was very inept. At one point, we were driving down the road. Our armed escort was carrying wooden sticks, and we thought, all right, this is not, they're, very, they're not taking the escort seriously. We're getting threatening calls. People are planning stories in the press that, we, that I've been kidnapped. So the embassy, for the first time in two years, I called the embassy and asked if they could, you know, do a favor. I couldn't get a plane ticket out. I needed, I needed a way out. So the embassy, the embassy said, well, we're picking up all these internal communications in Karachi between the intelligence agencies, and your name keeps coming up. So we know they're watching you. We can't tell whether they're watching you for your safety or whether, whether they're the threat or whether they're trying to protect you from the threat, but we'll get you out. So they put me... They, sent, they said, wait, wait an hour or two, we'll, we're going to send a bulletproof car. They were using words like assassination and suicide bombing, and I thought, oh, man. <laughs> so they uh, pull up in this black uh, Land Rover. I jump in the car. They take me to the airport. And as I'm in the airport, as I'm in the, the um, terminal waiting to leave, I keep trying to call my dad to tell my dad what had happened. And my father is a two-star Marine general, and he was working the Pentagon at the time. And every time that I started to try and tell him the story, the phone kept cutting out. And I thought, oh, man, and, this, and if you thought I'm sweating now, oh, my gosh, I was, it was unbelievable. And so I get, to, I get to Dubai, and I want to read a short passage from Dubai. At this point, I think that I sought the nearest bar, ordered the stiffest drink, and, and thought, you know, I don't, I don't know when I would go back to Pakistan. So when my wife and I had been kicked out in January, I'd left feeling jealous of anyone who got to stay to watch, to live in this fascinating country as it wrestled against military dictatorship, vied to enact the rule of law, and struggled to form a single, unified national identity. I was particularly envious of all the foreign journalists who had not been kicked out, who could still travel anywhere in Pakistan doing their work. Why did I have to go home? But I also knew all along that I'd be able to get back, stay a few months and let the air clear. That's all it would take, I thought. This time was different. I left in a bulletproof car. And I knew, sitting in Dubai, that unfortunately I was done with Pakistan for a while. I needed a lot more time away from the intelligence agencies. And I had left most of my optimism about Pakistan back at the Sufi religious festival. Really, what was there to look forward to? Musharraf was gone, but the military was still in control. Elections had brought a democratically elected civilian government, but average Pakistanis felt no more empowered than they did before. And despite the populist rhetoric of the Pakistan People's Party, Poor people still couldn't afford basic commodities like wheat and tea, never mind luxuries like electricity. Pakistan stood at the verge of, of bankruptcy in almost every sense. But what was the agency's problem with me? Who knows? Maybe they thought I was someone I was not. Maybe they felt threatened by me. I know, it's kind of a silly, self-aggrandizing thing to say, but why would they plant stories in the newspaper that I had been kidnapped? Maybe after a few years I'd feel comfortable enough to go back. Maybe by then they would have forgotten about me. Nicholas who? <laughs> Schmidl? Any relation to Nicholas Shamble? That would be a conversation I'd look forward to. I just hope I can remember how to speak Urdu when the time comes. So why, why was I chased out, and why, why would the Pakistani government have had some beef with me? This kind of brings us up to the final theme of the book, which is uh, the Taliban and the rise of the Taliban over the course of the past several years. Um, over, over 2006 and 2007, I made countless trips to the northwest frontier province and to Baluchistan. Never actually inside Waziristan, I should clarify, uh, but, but right up to the border and, and into Der Adam Khail, which is one of, the, one of the federally administered tribal areas. It's kind of the only one you, could, you can accidentally say that you're just passing through and dip off the road for a second, stay a few hours, and get back on the road. Um, but if there was one trip that, that stood out from all of them, it was, in, it was in October of 2007 when I ventured into the Swat Valley. So it was about two weeks before the army, the first army operation began. And I had a friend, a local journalist, who said he could take me around, introduce me, and you know, show me the talibs for them. For, you know, I could see the talibs for myself. And for three days, I was a guest of the Taliban, of various Taliban groups there. The first night that we were in Swat, he arranged for us to meet the leader, or the, the emir of Tariq e Nafaz Shariat Mohammadiyah, which is... TNSM, the group that the Pakistani government recently signed a peace deal with. Now, the, the gist of the story that I was working on was that the Taliban had been split into sort of the old generation of Taliban and, and a newer generation of Taliban, and this TNSM represented the old generation of Taliban. So this guy said he would host us for dinner. We should meet him a little bit outside the city of Mingora. And he would get in the car, take us to his village, which was about two hours outside of, of Mingora in the, in the mountains. So on the way to his house, we got a phone call as we were winding along this river, along, along the Swat River. We get a phone call, 
and someone says to us, yo, you guys should be very, very careful because the Taliban have set up a checkpoint, a roadblock, and it's about, where are you again? We described where we were. They said, yeah, it's just about the, around, around the next corner. So sure enough, we pull around the next corner, and there are five trucks of Taliban. And they're looking for three things. They're looking for tape decks, CD player, tape decks and CD players, women that are improperly covered, and spies. Now, I'm in the back seat wearing more or less a disguise, dressed in local clothes. My hair is dyed. Um, I've got a, a scarf over my shoulder and an Urdu newspaper that I've got my nose into, so hoping that no one will see me, and feeling really self-conscious, like a kid on you know, Halloween who's suddenly gotten in trouble wearing a Spider-Man costume, and you realize how silly you look. So, but Iqbal Khan calls ahead. Iqbal Khan, who was a guy who was meeting us, said, give me your license plate number real quick and a description of your car, and don't worry about it. So I want to describe the scene as we rolled up to this checkpoint. Five flatbed trucks blocked the road. As many as 50 talibs, with, as many as 50 talibs with black turbans, shoulder-length hair, and long beards were packed tightly on the back bed of each truck. Their rocket launchers and Kalashnikovs poked out in every direction. They looked like a frightening combination of livestock being taken to slaughter in an overstuffed vessel of Viking raiders. If one budged from his spot, he might have swiped his fellow Talib in the back of the head with a rifle barrel. A few dozen Talibs made an impromptu checkpoint while a line of cars waited inspection. In the vehicle behind us, a husband, wife, and daughter looked anxious. The teenage girl fumbled to fix her headscarf to meet the Talib's expectations. We rolled forward in line, moving at a slow walker's pace. I unfolded an Urdu newspaper and pretended to be reading. One more car in front of us. The Talibs motioned him to the side. Our driver eased forward. The Talibs looked over the car and then waved us through. I discarded the newspaper, spun in my seat, and stared out the back window. Like a true voyeur, I wanted to watch and keep watching the Talibs for hours, to cram the image into my mind forever of them commanding a road. Then maybe I could go back later and zoom in for a closer look. At the moment of closest contact, I was too scared of being noticed to take pictures. Analysts had long warned of, quote, Talibanization sweeping northwest Pakistan, a looming threat, a different kind of Pakistan. That Pakistan was no longer a figment of someone's worried imagination. Four hours from the capital, five trucks of militants, totally unchallenged by the police, the paramilitary forces, or the army, had arrived and were in charge. So we get to, so we pass through the checkpoint, and Iqbal Khan is waiting for us, and he gets in the car, and he starts laughing. You can see that we're, <laughs> we're absolutely ner nervous as all get out, and he says, what happened? We said, well, they waved us right through. He said, yeah, you're our guests. Don't worry. So we, Iqbal Khan, we get in the car with Iqbal Khan, and we go to his house. It's during the holy month of Ramadan, and everyone's very excited. The sun's setting. We're sort of racing to make it to Iqbal Khan's house before the sun sets, and I haven't told anyone that I've been sneaking power bars in the back seat for the past several hours, but everyone's very excited that it's going to be this communal breaking of the fast. After, uh, after dinner, Iqbal Khan, our, our guest, takes out his phone and starts showing me, starts sort of boasting about these CD, the DVDs that he has stored on his phone or recordings of Taliban blowing up American uh, tanks and soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so with my dad being the general and my brother at that time serving in Al-Ambar province in Iraq, I thought, you know, this is, this is getting a little uncomfortable. It's probably not the time for me to stand up and announce that I'm actually a part of the crusading army that he's sworn his life against. And yet, you know, it, it raised this very complicated moral quandary. So I changed the subject, and Iqbal Khan and I started talking a little bit more about al-Qaeda ideology and philosophy. And he asked me if I'd ever read Osama bin Laden's book of philosophy. And I said to Iqbal, I said, I haven't read it. He says, come in, come into the other room, I'll show it to you. So we go into the other room, and this is Iqbal Khan's, uh, his sort of memorial to all of his al-Qaeda paraphernalia. And he says, actually, the book is in that backpack down there at the bottom. And, I sa and he says, but uh, I can't touch that backpack because I promised the person who left that backpack that I wouldn't touch it until they came back. And I nudged Iqbal Khan, and I said, all right, so who's the guest that you're so worried about? And he says, well, that bag was left by Iman al-Zawahiri, and I'm not sure when he's coming back to get it. And I thought, okay, that's probably about the time that we go home. And so this, uh, and this, this theme, so the next day, sorry, the next day we call Iqbal Khan again, and we ask Iqbal Khan if he wants to go to the 
Taliban camp with us that's run by Malana Fazlullah, by the Talibs that are actually making all the problems right now in SWAT. And Iqbal Khan's response to us is, no way, those guys are extremists. And this illustrated this divide between the next generation Taliban and the old generation Taliban. And so I can, we can talk more about the peace deals and recent developments and whatnot, but I'll uh, hand over the floor for a second. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, well, I have, a, I have a few questions, but uh, I think I'll first open the uh, room up to all of you. So um, since we're being webcasted, I ask that before you ask your question, you wait for the uh, microphone to arrive and that you then give your name and affiliation and please try to keep your question brief. So first question. Yes, over here. Just just wait for the mic. Sorry. Uh, Robin Wright, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Nick, could you take us up to date and talk about what's happening today, what your prognosis is, how long you think this is going to go on, who's likely to win, um, and what it's going to take for the United States to um, help Pakistan bring law and order back to this volatile part of the country? That's a good question with a very long answer. Um, let me just talk a little bit about, I think, the sort of the, the, the tide in SWAT. I mean, the SWAT Taliban overplayed their hand when they moved into Bonaire a few weeks ago. They actually overplayed their hand before that when they were, they were given, uh, President Zardari signed this deal that was going to allow them their own mini state in SWAT. And the notion the whole time was that we'll give them this, we'll give them this little mini emirate and if they move out then we'll really see what they're all about. And of course we all were very skeptical and cynical and, and said there's no way. And in fact, the irony is that it kind of worked out just like President Zardari said it would. The Taliban showed that they were, A, not content with just having Sharia courts because when the Sharia courts were set up and the Taliban were going in there with their local grievances and the Sharia courts ruled against the Taliban, the Taliban kicked up a big storm and went stomping out of the courts and said, we don't recognize these courts. So there was that aspect. The second aspect was that they were still killing soldiers and when they were killing soldiers, they were beheading soldiers. And for the Pakistani population, which is sympath very sympathetic and has always been very sympathetic to the idea of the Taliban, to the notion of these sort of righteous, humble, you know, bumpkins that are, are nonetheless righteous, humble Muslims, that began turning as well. And the third factor was when they were seen flogging this 17-year-old girl who had allegedly refused the marriage proposal of one of the Talibs. So this all set the stage that when the Taliban moved into Bunair district a few weeks ago and the alarm bells went off that they were now within 60 miles or 70 miles of Islamabad, they really, this, this caused a major shift in public opinion. And the Taliban now realize, in SWAT particularly, that the public opinion has turned against them. So last night, as they're now, as the army is constricting around the city of Mingora and there's talk about a major bloodbath and urban, urban combat in the streets, now you see Milana Fazlula yesterday saying that we are going to uh, withdraw from the city because we want to spare civilian casualties. And so now they're getting back to the notion that, you know, that we're not in this just to kill a bunch of Pakistani soldiers and that this is not. So you s I, feel, I feel like the Taliban realize they've overplayed their hand and are now scrambling for a PR strategy that can help them save face, save the land that they've taken, and somehow get the army to back off. The question is how the army will respond. The notion that the army is going to, as swiftly as the army has taken over parts of SWAT, is now going to turn its sights to South Waziristan is, is, is I think, very, very misguided. I don't know, I mean, what, what can the U.S. do? The, the second part of your question. The U.S. can kind of do what it's doing right now. In my mind, the, the gesture from, uh, of, of the money to the, to the IDPs for the, for the refugees from SWAT has probably been, it's been very, very, very well received. And, but it, it, these camps are the testing ground. And these camps are, are where the battle for hearts and minds, if you will, is going on. I mean, when the fact that the most prominent group besides the UN that's working in these camps is the humanitarian wing of lashkar e taiba that's not a positive development. So there needs to be, you know, the Pakistani government for right now, and there can be U.S. oversight on this money, but there should be no shortage of money that the Pakistani government has to hand out and food to hand out and so the U.S. can be sort of behind the scenes helping with that. Let's move south uh, for just a minute <clears throat> and go to Baluchistan. Um, one of your original goals was to uh, talk about a report on ethnic 
uh, politics in Pakistan. You dedicate at least one chapter uh, to that province. So what's your take on what's going on there, on, on the insurgency? I mean, it's very underreported in this country, um, and uh, it's often characterized as a low-burning insurgency, sort of gets lost in what's going on elsewhere. So what's your take on the situation? Should we be worried? What do you think could be happening in the next few months? Okay, so to put it in perspective real quick, Pakistan is about 180 million people, and Baluchistan is, covers half 48-49% of Pakistani territory. And yet, there are only about 5 million people in Balochistan. So it's, it's I think that in the late 70s, a U.S. geological survey described it as being the closest thing to the moon on the United States. It's, it's incredibly arid. And there are two sort of, two dynamics of the violence and the instability in Balochistan. One of which is that U.S. intelligence believes that Mullah Omar and, and all the senior Taliban, Afghan Taliban leaders are sitting in Quetta, using Quetta as, as, a, as a safe haven and as a base. The second half of that is, as you mentioned, that the Baluchis, who constitute, I think, about three million of the province, have never been sold on the idea of Pakistan. One of the Baluchi leaders, uh, Ataulu Mangal, uses, he sort of boast that he's never actually stepped foot in Punjab. And so this, uh, so it is kind of a, of a, a low simmering insurgency. The, the casualties aren't significant, but the army is deployed, the Pakistani army is deployed all over the province trying to keep things in check. What's happened is that this is where all the natural gas is coming from, and this is also where the, the Pakistani government has set up a port, uh, the, the port in Gwadar, which uh, is going to bring significant revenues if, if done properly over the course of the, of the coming decades. And the Baluchis feel like they've never seen the revenue from the gas, they'll never see the revenue from the port, and they'll be made more or less secondhand citizens and slaves in, in their own province. Okay, Bob. Um, Bob Hathaway here at the center. Uh, Nick, I've had the good fortune to read about half your book so far, and uh, what you've said today is simply uh, what my appetite for fin finish it up. Um, I want to follow up on Michael's question, but then one of my own. How serious is the insurgency in Baluchistan? Can you envision a time when it... Um, represents a substantial threat to actually fragment the country. Uh, and then my other question um, has to do with governance in the tribal areas. Uh, one hears in this capital or this country with some frequency proposals or suggestions that FATA should be fully integrated into Pakistan, um, uh, perhaps combining with Northwest Frontier Province. But anyway, the residents of the tribal areas should enjoy all the uh, freedoms and liberties accorded to all Pakistani citizens. Um, others will say that the last thing that uh, the tribals want is to become more closely integrated um, in a system, in a government dominated by Punjabis. Um, so I'd uh, value your thoughts on these, this proposal as well. Sure. I think that regarding the Baluchistan question, um, I, don't, I don't see fragmentation or balkanization being a real possibility for a couple of reasons. One of which is that the Baluchi, the, the numbers of Baluchis in the city of Quetta, the main city in Baluchistan, are, are, they constitute less than half of the population of Quetta. To be able to sort of override the government's authority there, I mean, Quetta is a, is a chaotic and, and frenetic city, but, but I don't see the insurgency really spilling out of the hills and, and affecting the city, and so it, it will continue to kind of almost be a hindrance, but never anything that gather, gathers enough uh, wellspring of, of support. Regarding Fatah, it's hard to say. But it's so hard to take a measure of public opinion in Fatah, but, and, it's, and it's also impossible to try and institute and implement any sort of governance reforms when right now the government has no authority there. So ideally I think for Fatah to, for FATA, for Pakistan to be able to, to sort of proceed forward in a peaceful trajectory, Fatah eventually will have to be integrated into the Northwest Frontier Province. 
there's actually there's a friend of a colleague of ours, Josh White, who's done a great amount of research on the, the, the sort of legalities and the historical precedents of bringing in you know, ungoverned territories. But um, I think it has to happen eventually. I'm just not sure how you do it. Uh, okay, let's uh, actually we'll start with uh, the question in the back, the woman in the brown uh, jacket. Thank you, Michael, uh, and thank you, Nicholas. Uh, my my name is Sabra Qureshi. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, on the issue about you in your interaction with different <coughs> Taliban individuals or groups or even some of these leaders. I wondered if you. Uh, th there's a lot of discussion about dialogue, the need for dialogue with moderate groups, and th I think there's there's a, a lot of confusion around what we label moderate versus extremism, and there's a lot of kind of it maybe may sound a little oxymoronic. Um, do you feel in this in in your interaction that there are amongst these groups <clears throat> certain groups that one could genuinely call um, relatively more moderate whom one could have dialogue with or is it just a ploy to further kind of s their own insidious agenda because it, it's important there is the government will always go back to trying to dialogue right. and one is always scared that will it just take us back to square one after all that's happened right right so uh, it, uh, if you could just uh, I think there were I think there have been times when there may have been groups that could have been engaged in dialogue I think that the longer the insurgency continues, the more the, the sort of run-of-the-mill Pashtuns who just simply want to live a conservative lifestyle and keep their women folk covered and live according to Sharia and be very strict about it, that circle is becoming more and more and more, if you will, contaminated by foreign Al-Qaeda takfiri ideology. And so it's becoming increasingly unlikely that there are groups that can be dialogued with. So, for instance, with Muslim, so with the SWAT Taliban, Muslim Khan, who's, who's the spokesman of the SWAT Taliban, he lived in Boston for four years. He was actually a painter, an artist in Boston on 9-11. Understood American values, was, was very easy to talk to. If you would have asked me two years ago, I would have said for sure the SWAT Taliban could have been, we could have negotiated and given them SWAT. And the Muslim Khan is right now the same guy who's saying that, you know, we, we're, we're, slitting their, we're slitting the soldiers' throats and it's totally sanctioned by Sharia. So I think that that is a, uh, I think the circle is shrinking. What were you going to say? No, I, I, I think there's a little bit of a confusion here regarding the ethnic, uh, the ethnicities of Pashtuns versus the very extreme ideology of Taliban. And I think one needs to clarify because Pashtuns are not or do not relate to the kind of extremist ideology that you that one hears and talks about within the Taliban and I think the two are very very different because if one goes back to the history of the Pashtuns oh. they would not at all want to be tied or even in any way linked with the kind of Taliban ideology that we yeah, see Yeah but that's that's, that's, the, that's the history though that's not today and I think that if it's unfortunate that when you look around right now not certainly not every Pashtun is a Taliban but nearly every Taliban is a Pashtun and so I'm not saying that once born a Pashtun that you, incre you will become a Taliban, but the Taliban have successfully grafted their religious ideology and religious identity onto an ethnic ideology and an ethnic identity. Sir, you had your hand up right here. And then uh, actually after that, why don't uh, we go to this gentleman uh, right here, Sue, the blue uh, jacket. No, we'll start with him and then move on to him. Thank you. Kelsey Shroff from the Law Library of Congress in Washington. Uh, you started off uh, with the uh, statement about a young visionary who coined the name Pakistan. I haven't read your book, but perhaps you mentioned the uh, creator of Pakistan, the late Qaeda Azam, who had a vision of Pakistan as a liberal democracy, albeit for Muslims, but where other people of other faith could live and practice their faiths. Now you have the spectacle in Swat somewhere, I believe, where the Taliban have extracted the jazia, the, uh, the religious tax on Sikhs living in the area. What has happened to that original vision of the Qaeda-e-Azam? Uh, 
about Pakistan. Does that, is that still viable? Is that even talked about? Or are we now into the ethnic tensions where Pakistan is breaking along the ethnic lines? Mm, I, I think, that, I mean, that's a great question. I think that it's, a, but I think that, unfortunately, four decades after Qaeda Azam, we had another leader of Pakistan who was sort of institutionalizing state-sanctioned Islamicization, that being, that being General Zia. And the country, I mean, that is, that leg, his legacy right now is much more firmly implanted on the political and social culture of Pakistan than Qaeda Azam's legacy. Qadi Azam is, is cited by columnists, drawing room columnists, who, who sit in Islamabad or Karachi and write columns and sort of decry the state of Pakistan and cite how we've drifted from Qadi Azam, but I don't think it really goes much more than that. Okay, uh, sir, with the uh, blue jacket. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kamar Jabarkel. I'm here from Center for Advanced Operational Culture Learning of the U.S. Marine Corps in Kwaniko. Uh, I'm a native Pashtun, and uh, I spent almost uh, almost half of my life in Pakistan, in Peshawar, Waziristan, uh, and uh, different parts of Pakistan. Uh, you mentioned before that while you were in Swat, uh, Iqbal Khan uh, received you according to some protocols, and then he told you that you are protected, you are our guest. I think, uh, based on my understanding and my knowledge, uh, that protection was not based on the interpretation of the Sharia law by Taliban. That was based on the Code of Honor, Pashtun Code of Honor, Pashtun Wali, which is also, uh, Pashtun Wali is a pre-Islamic law uh, for 5,000 years. Uh, so, uh, my question is that why, like you said, that almost every Talib is Pashtun, uh, I will not agree with that, but uh, even if we take that correct and we say I, why our Pashtuns are uh, Taliban or uh, all Talibans are Pashtuns, what is the reason that Taliban, uh, Pashtuns are joining Taliban? Uh, Pashtuns are, uh, based on my information, especially if, if I talk about Pakistani Pashtuns especially, Pakistani Pashtuns, uh, we never call them Pakistani Pashtuns, we call them Eastern Pashtuns, uh, they are much educated, much more peaceful, and more liberal, open, open mind Pashtuns compared to the Pashtuns of hills in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, because uh, they uh, had access to many uh, resources, they had opportunities to go to schools. And what is the reason that why they are becoming so radicals, and who is uh, providing this support? And uh, uh, that, that is one, one part of my question. I thought so many times and I lost my question. But the second part of my question is that uh, in, in the Pashtun areas, there are always authorities in power. If we go back to the history in Afghanistan, none of the authority were legitimate authority without support of the real power. And the real power is the tribal structure, the tribal leaders. But today, the tribal leaders, the tribal structure of the Pashtuns are target since 1978, Soviet uh, invasion in Afghanistan, Soviet uh, communist regime coup and Soviet invasion. <laughs> and somehow, as a result of the Charlie Wilson war, the Pashtun tribal structure has been uh, not completely eliminated, not, but, but it has been weakened. And that is one of the reasons that now the Islamic uh, radical movements are taking over because the role of mullah or imam was under the khan, under the tribal leaders. So don't you think that supporting or restoration of the tribal structure or tribal power will eliminate this problem or solve this problem? Thank you. Sorry for this long question. But no, no, no. I think it's a, it's a great question. I think your point about Pashtun Wali is, is very well taken and is, and is right on the mark. I mean, the custom of hospitality, the, the notion, I mean, I often say that, that you kill one Taliban, you create ten more Talibans. That's much more imbued within the Pashtun ideology and the Pashtun culture than it is necessarily within the, within the Taliban culture. As for why are Pashtuns joining the Taliban, I mean, I, that's probably, you could probably get a grant from the Department of Defense for $500 million to pursue that question. I think that's, that's the key question right now. But, you know, if we look at SWAT, for instance, I mean, SWAT has been a center of, of sophistication and, and, and uh, an intersection and a crossroad of ideas. I mean, there are Buddhist sculptures in Swat that when my wife and I visited there in July, uh, June of 2007, 
We had a we, we rented a, um, a, a guide for the day. He drove us around, showed us all the Buddhist sculptures. When I went back in August, half of them had been either shot by with AK-47s, rocket launchered, etc., by the Taliban. So, what happened in that period of time was the intensified int information campaign. I mean, you realize that in Swat. Well, when we get out of Mingora and we're in the rural areas, there's one main mode of information that's been that's always been the BBC. Now, it's Milana Fazlullah's radio station, and it was much more. It's been it's become much more important for the past several years for someone who's venturing into the village to know what Milana Fazlullah said last night on his radio station in his sermon than it is to know what the BBC said last night about what was going on. Milana Fazlulu was saying, you know, was dictating everything as to, you know, was, was making demands on the way that the market should be run to who should be in the markets, et cetera. So that information campaign has been lost. And, and it's beyond me why with drone technology and all the technology at the hands of the, of, of the Department of Defense, why we can't jam radio stations. I, I still can't quite get my brain around that. As for who's supporting them, I'm not sure. It sounded like we were fishing for an India answer, but I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't say who's supporting the Taliban. I mean, I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of foreign support. The Taliban have also taken over. We've seen the Times, New York Times has reported they've taken over emerald mines, uh, quarries in Mohmand Agency, the timber industry in Swat. So they have all these various things. Kidnapping has been very lucrative. As for the tribal structure itself, um, the former political agent of South Waziristan, Khalid Aziz, wrote in a column about a year ago, probably the most on point assessment of the tribal structure. He said what the Taliban, what, what the British couldn't do in 100 years, and what Pakistan has not been able to do in 50 years, the Taliban have been able to do in seven years, which is to totally dismantle the tribal system and totally undermine the authority of the Khans and of the Maliks. I don't know how you recover that. The idea that we would now sort of give money and guns to these guys is a frightening thought, because when we look back to the, to the infighting in Afghanistan during the 1990s, eventually Mullah Omar and his boys rolled in as the bigger and badder and nastier power to sort of quell the infighting and said, we're in charge. If the Taliban are already partisans in this struggle, who's going to be the one that rolls in and says, you know, who's going to roll in, quell the fighting and say, we're in charge? So that's why I think it's a little bit, it's difficult to think about trying to arm the tribes because A, the tribes have lost all of their authority. And, and the way that the government can start recovering that is by, it's, it's such a long, it's, it's very easy for them to be dismantled and very long for them to be rebuilt. But I, th I think it's a great question. Okay, yes? Taha Gaya with the Pakistani American Leadership Center. Uh, just to kind of follow up on one of the things you said, Holbrook in his testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee actually specifically asked for radio jamming equipment and those sorts of things. So I think they're hopefully getting on that program. Uh, my, my question is, uh, recently in, in, a, in a lecture, uh, Josh White actually said, Pakistanis generally like the idea of Sharia, but they don't like the reality of Sharia, which kind of echoes some of what, you, what you've been saying. Uh, so my question is, to what extent are people joining the Taliban and, in, you know, in the interest of actually implementing Sharia? Because from what, from what I understand, the, you know, the legal system in Pakistan is already based on laws that cannot conflict with the Quran and the Sunnah. And it seems like maybe the only demands that these people are making that are different from what is actually happening is maybe, you know, the, co the, the, the mandated covering of women, closing down CDs. And, and that seems like a silly thing to go to war over. Uh, so I, my question is, to what extent is it Sharia and to what extent is it that the government of Pakistan has just failed to deliver government services to these people and they see the Taliban as an alternative uh, to the failure of the government of Pakistan to deliver those uh, government services. I think that yeah, I think that that's I think it's probably much more the second. I think if we look at what's happened in SWAT, what happened in SWAT to keep coming back to this, the judicial structures had totally collapsed. The police had stopped patrolling the roads. There was no government there when the Taliban moved in. It wasn't that the Taliban necessarily over. I mean, they did in some way scare the police in, to hiding in their barracks. And then when the police only hid back in the barracks, and then when the kidnappers started coming out and working the streets. Then the Taliban said, okay, we'll take care of the kidnappers, and then they became the ones who were the new police. So it is much more the second. I think the biggest question will be whether, how, if the, if, the, if the insurgency continues to spread east into the Punjab, where there is government control to, to a greater extent. Social services still aren't great, but there is government authority. The question is whether, what, what will be, what, where will public support come there? I mean, will public support 
it's, it was very easy for locals in the tribal areas and in Swat to simply join the Taliban because out of coercion. Um, I'm not sure sort of how it'll play in, whether, whether you'll see the militant groups that are already strong in southern Punjab linking in with the Taliban and just forcing people and sort of patrolling the streets, or whether there will be some sort of public support. Yes. Just wait one second for the mic. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum, Middle East Institute. Nicholas, could that public support, and then maybe they've missed the boat now, but we we got the inkling here that there was a class dimension to mm, this. Definitely. Uh, and uh, it seems among the things that the Taliban have uh, missed the boat on was to play that effectively because that would have been their, their link particularly to the southern Punjab right. and elsewhere. C question. Um, it seems that public opinion is has shifted very rather suddenly, and for you know for reasons that you've just mentioned here, that they suddenly realized uh, that uh, that these people were not the genuine uh, item that they th that they thought they were, and they had views that just incompatible with the Pakistan state and constitution. Um, at the same time, what seems unchanged is what has emerged in this period of time, and that is a vehement anti-Americanism. Uh, what, uh, what used to be a conspiracy theory now has become a virtual consensus. And you sort of got it with your remark here. Uh, um, you know, who's behind them? Today, if you ask uh, most Pakistanis, they would say the United States. And this is all deliberate to take Pakistan apart. Uh, so do you detect also that somehow, even though they have perhaps come to a greater realization of the challenge that's presented by the Tariqa Taliban and their like, uh, that rather than it saying, oh, the Americans were right all along, right. saying, yeah, uh, and the Americans are responsible for, 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 for this as part of this larger program together with India. Right. Well, that's, I think, I mean, like you said, the, the Pakistani public has turned in one sense in realizing that the Taliban do constitute a true threat to the nation and to the national identity, and yet, in large part because of the drone strikes. I mean, there are, there are these, these invisible f buzzing things that are flying over Pakistani territory, and the Taliban, when, when, when a missile strikes a village in South Waziristan, the Taliban are beating the U.S. information agencies by days in terms of the numbers that are killed and who was killed and whatnot. I mean, there was a report a couple of days ago, I think it says that the Taliban get casualty rates, get, get casualty numbers out in 26 minutes after a drone strike. And because these are, because the drones are being flown by, either the, you know, because the drones are being operated by the, the CIA, we, there's never, it's, it's always suspected U.S. airstrike. It's not, I mean, it's just such a, so, so that, that is a huge thing is that the middle class, those who are educated in the U.S. that are sympathetic to American ideals are so anti-American policy. And I think this actually poses, this will pose the biggest quandary right now for Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif has the popularity to be able to get the country behind him, to be able to get serious and wage a sort of a serious counterinsurgency campaign that President Zardari, with his 19 percent approval rating right now, can't do. And yet, the minute that Nawaz Sharif steps into power and the Americans are sort of all over and visiting him and whatnot, the question is, does his, does his, do his numbers then, is it inevitable that his numbers will plummet? And I think that's the problem, is how do you show the Pakistan, this gets back to Robin's question, how do you show the Pakistani government support without having your thumbprints all over it? Because that's the kiss of death. Let me ask another question. You were a U.S. journalist uh, working in Pakistan and, and undoubtedly you, uh, met and worked with or friends with Pakistani journalists and uh, I was wondering if you could just uh, offer some impressions on the Pakistan and Pakistani media core I mean we know that it's celebrated as one of the uh, few uh, well it's it's thought of as uh, one of the more vibrant and um, uh, feisty uh, organizations very successful and there have been a lot of talented Pakistani journalists in fact, we had a group of them here uh, for a workshop uh, last year. So I was just wondering, based on your time there and those that you met, what you would say about the uh, media institutions? Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, I was going to say vibrant, 
fearless. I mean, there, there's, there's a, particularly against the state, it's almost as though the average Pakistani journalist is, is, is less scared of, of fighting against military dictatorship, but they don't want to, I mean, they don't want to wage into the questions of the religious direction of the state. And this was for a while what the Taliban had monopolized. No one could really get on TV and before the Taliban started overplaying their hand and flogging women, newscasters were, were wary of getting on TV and denouncing the Taliban just for living according to Sharia and SWAT. So, but I mean, I, I relied heavily on them and I, and I, you know, many of them right now, for very good reasons, don't talk to me. They, <laughs> this is, but I mean, they took me, they took me in and then when I got kicked out, it was kind of like, ooh, you know, I never knew that guy. I never worked with him before. But they, what I did would have been impossible without Pakistani journalists, so. Uh, I think we have time for another question or two. Uh, were there any others? Okay, it looks like there's one uh, over here. I thought we had, it. yes, we do have a question. Yes, uh, unless there's another Pakistan question. I'm Helen Rafael, Resources for the Future. And I'm wondering, I own your book, by the way. I've read about a quarter of it. I'm enjoying it very much. And I'm wondering what your next big project is. Are you going to do another whole country or what? Good question, good question. Um, I, I, you know, Pakistan was, was, um, was kind of easy in that sense. We'd gotten a fellowship. We went there. We lived the two years and then came back. And after being kicked out, we thought, well, I've got a good ending to the story. I'll just sort of sit down and start writing. Um, now, I don't know, this, this took two years of living, a year and a half of writing. I'm not sure what I'm ready to make another three and a half year, four year investment in, so good question. <laughs> well, we're talking, I mean, we want to live in Spain, so if anyone's interested in a book about Spain. <laughs> yeah, if anyone's interested in funding a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. My name is Ahmed. I'm from Pakistan Embassy. I just wanted to maybe apply a mid-course correction into one of the understanding that has been given in this, that Pakhtuns are Taliban, or all the Talibans are Pakhtun. You must be following the recent uh, military operations. The Taliban that are caught are Chechnyans, Uzbeks, all those coming from Afghanistan, Germany, Southeast, Chinese even. So to brand them only uh, what we call Pakhtun, it may not be a thing. If it is not considered a conspiracy theory, uh, theory as Mr. Uh, Marvin said, the people in Pakistan are getting surprised that having a very strong country like United States in Afghanistan, how could the people come in these areas? Can you rephrase your se the second part of the question, the last I part? Mean, the people are a bit surprised that why these Taliban, I mean the Taliban are in SWAT they are getting continuous reinforcements with American forces in Afghanistan. Well, I, I mean, the Chechnyans, Uzbeks, you must be knowing that the type of the weaponry these Taliban are carrying, these are not made in the Raya Adam Khil. Right. Okay. Well, a couple, a couple points. First of all, my point about the Pashtun Taliban question is because when I think about, there are, there are certainly Punjabis, there are, there are people from Sepai Sahaba, Jaish -e Muhammad. When I was in Swat, I, with my own eyes, saw Uzbeks walking around. I know that they're there. But when I sort of conceptualize them, in the same way that Pakistanis tend to conceptualize them, it's a foreign militants and a local militants divide. And so I think of local militants as Taliban and as Pakhtuns. And when I think of, I mean, I think that the, the hospitality of, of Tariqa Taliban and Muslim Khan and Milan Fazlullah and all of them are very welcome towards having Jaish and Muhammad people come in and practice. Jaish and Muhammad, Lashkar e Taiba elements also are much better trained than the, than the sort of the average Pakhtun. Um, so the flip side of the question, of course, I mean, there are two sides to your question. The, the Americans have also been asking for the past seven years, how come the Taliban are coming so easily across the border into Afghanistan, right? So it's, it's I mean, there, there is a lot of sophisticated weaponry, weaponry. We're seeing, there was a report in the New York Times last week that said that the Afghan Taliban are using weapons that the Americans have given to the Afghan National Army. And I think that we should be candid with ourselves and think that there's potentially the same thing that's happening 
as Americans are giving weaponry and technology to the Pakistani army that's supposed to be used against the Taliban, some of it's making it into the wrong hands, in the same way that some of the weaponry that's being given to the Afghan army is making it into the wrong hands. I'm sorry, the Pakistan army is not getting any weaponry. The only thing it got is the helicopters. The weaponry, like M16 rifles, they were found in Swat and the American forces were right about Hmm. Well, but they are making, but, uh, but they are making M16s in SWAT. I mean, in in Dar Adam Khail, for sure. Uh, but I was trying to Pakistan army haven't got any, uh, I mean, rifles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that is being found with this. Yes, they have got a lot from the United States in terms of helicopters, in terms of you could say the Tayyip bombs, but not the rifles with which the Taliban are fighting. And the most interesting question is from where they have gotten the anti-aircraft guns. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have to. Well, actually, if it's brief, if you promise it's brief, we could do it. But uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. How do you see the uh, role of Iran in supporting insurgency in both Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, yeah. I mean, I think I was actually in Western Afghanistan for a month in in the summer of 2007, looking at Iranian influence. I think that Iranian influence in Afghanistan is is a very mixed bag. I think. Culturally and socially, the Iranians have long. I mean, I speak I speak Persian uh, that I learned in, in Iran. In in Kabul, when I'm speaking Farsi, people are making fun of me and saying that I speak like a Frenchman because it's very flowery. And yet, you go to Herat on the western border, and it's like, oh, brother, come here, you speak such beautiful Farsi. So it's uh, so I mean, the the cultural influence on the western border is significant, and the Iranians have obviously have major ideological problems, differences. I mean, they almost went to war with Afghanistan, with the Taliban government. And yet, I think that the Iranians are probably hedging their bets to some extent and are probably working for stability at one level in Afghanistan and making sure that if the U.S. leaves, that they also have some influence with whatever elements are there and trying to make sure that the U.S. is not sort of on steady ground on either side of their border. I mean, if you were Iran, and your arch enemy was, you know, on the other side of the border, you know, I think he'd probably be playing many bets as well. Yeah. Well, we promised we would release you at 12.45, so we really should wrap up. But this has been a very, uh, very interesting, interesting and stimulating session. So why don't you join me in another round of applause for Nicholas Schmidl. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We're adjourned. <laughs>